Hello. Um, I'm really sad that Republica is going to end soon, but I don't know about you guys. I'm pretty excited to cut off my uh, conference band. It kind of smells like sweat and alcohol. But uh, so before I go on, I want to make sure that this is the beginning of a conversation. So please tweet at Trisha Wong if you have any questions or notes for us to talk about afterwards. Um, it's actually been quite fascinating to be at my first Republica and my first time in Germany. Before I came here, I had this perception of Republica as an activist conference. And now that I've hung out a few days, I can also see that it's a place for industry. And I find this confluence of communities of activists and industry particularly unique to Berlin, and it's actually quite fascinating. Uh, politics, technology, finance, and innovation, no one owns these things, although everyone is willing to take responsibility for them. And that, to me, seems to be the magic of what's going on here. It's just that outside of Berlin, sometimes, you know, activists and business circles don't usually talk to one another, even though they have many similar interests. And because of this, they often miss their own overlaps. And I'm sure that this has actually happens quite a lot, you know, here as well, but at least you can feel, you can really feel after these few days here that these two groups are mixing together. So uh, as Geraldine has said, I've spent most of my career doing work in China, Mexico, and the US. And I usually, I talk about, you know, China or values in digital governance or how people negotiate identity and social networks. But today I want to talk about a space where all of my research and work in those areas cross over because it's also a space where different communities are trying to solve the same problems but oftentimes miss their own overlaps. And that space comes in the form of big data, which is a very global topic. Um, some call this open data, others call it business intelligence. You know, regardless of the language, most people are using big data to uncover information that enables them to make better decisions. And I don't know if the conference producers did this on purpose, but the message of what I have to say today should underscore many of the themes we've heard from various speakers. You know, Ethan Zuckerman in his opening keynote suggested that greater data transparency has actually led to, you know, more dis mistrust in some areas. Uh, James Bridle's projects are a critique of this idea that collecting more data makes our society better. Um, you know, the wonderful and endearing Zygmunt Bauman is concerned, very deeply concerned, that the accumulation of personal data is corrupting our relationship with privacy. And we've also heard uh, a critical take on big data in different contexts, you know, in different sessions from, you know, pre-crime prediction from Matt Sayer to corporate surveillance from Wolfie uh, Crystal, and ethics and development context from several people in the global innovation gathering track. Now, the common thread that I've noticed amongst all these speakers is actually a very nuanced questioning of the value of big data, and in some cases, you know, asking, well, what is all this hype of big data about? And so what I want to try and do in my talk today is to continue these conversations that have been started by asking, you know, why do we have this belief that big data is more valuable than quant data? You know, where exactly did this come from? And as a sociologist, I want to ask, how did organizations start touting this idea? How did it creep into our institutional mindset? How did it creep into nonprofits, you know, activist circles, you know, pretty much everything? We see this big data kind of, you know, mindset in the blind enforcement of austerity measures to global indices of, you know, happiness to the internalization of self-worth based on social media accounts. So how did this numbers mindset become the de facto way of decision making and evaluation? So just to make sure we're all on the same page, because big data is like, you know, uh, a very kind of catch-all word for many things, let's just quickly define the term uh, big data. So the creator of the word uh, big data, Roger Magolis, said that he coined the term to capture this new reality that organizations now have the capacity to produce and store and analyze massive amounts of data at a scale that has never been possible before in history. So what this practically means is that instead of analyzing, you know, 10 Excel, you know, spreadsheets, uh, come, you know, we're now analyzing many databases across many warehouses. 
So what we're really talking about is just a matter of scale. Uh, you know, we have so much data now that all the data created before 2003, from the beginning of time, is now created every two days. So quite simply, big data is just quantitative data at a larger scale that now involves new digital technologies around capturing, storing, and analyzing. That's all it is. <laughs> it's, it's not a scary term, and it's not magic. So if big data is really just lots of quant data, what is all this hype about? Well, this hype revolves around the idea that the more data we have, the more it can predict our futures. And you see this everywhere. You look, you know, when you look at how people write about and implement big data as if it's like that next big thing that's going to solve our problem. I talk to organizations who are saying, well, we don't even know why we need big data. We've just been told we got to collect it and store it. And one day it's going to like be that thing that's going to, you know, give us the next innovation. So essentially big data's appeal is that it can tell us what's going to happen next and when. But I think big data utopianism, the notion that more big data leads to more predictability, is actually one of the most dangerous things that are happening in organizations today. And I think this you know, idea of entirely trusting data from computers is terribly wrong. Um, I personally witnessed the beginnings of the downfall of an entire company that privileged data captured by machines over data captured by humans. So in 2009, I started uh, researching at Nokia, which was the largest cell phone company at emerging markets at a time. And this is when, you know, cell phones look like this. And I was like super excited because I've been, you know, my first cell phone was a Nokia's and I've been using it since the late 90s and I was a total Nokia fangirl. So this is like my dream job. You know, Nokia was one of the first to hire social scientists. So when I, and by the time I started working there, I had already spent years of ethnographic work immersing myself into the lives of uh, Chinese migrants from, you know, working as a street vendor selling dumplings to living inside internet cafes. I had already been immersing myself. So while at Nokia, I you know, was able to take all this you know, past experience and I started seeing something new that led me to conclude that tech use amongst Chinese migrants was going to radically change. And I observed and captured many indicators that led me to conclude that low-income consumers were actually ready to move from, you know, feature, uh, you know, very inexpensive feature uh, cell phones to, you know, more expensive smartphones. I saw, you know, and this is, I, I saw this because I saw aspirations for upward mobility. Um, even though this was, you know, the, their houses at the time inside the city slums of, you know, the migrants I was living with, they were building, you know, large apartment complexes that featured uh, Caucasian families in places called the flower house, you know, romping through, you know, green fields. Uh, even though this is, you know, their bathroom and the temporary housing for migrants in cities, uh, they also were surrounded by advertisements that looked like this, featuring very high-end toilets. And even though they were using, you know, Nokia phones that were very cheap or, you know, Shanzai ones, they were being bombarded by iPhone advertisements that promised entry into a high-tech world. So it was clear to me after years of living and working with migrant workers, you know, around the world and especially, you know, in China, that the, the poorest people, um, you know, what some would call the bottom of the pyramid, would want to participate in a slice of consumer life that was aggressively being marketed everywhere. So based off of my data, I concluded that Nokia needed to replace their current product development strategy from making expensive smartphones for elite users to affordable smartphones for low-income users. And I excitedly reported my findings, even though I knew at the time this was a bit, you know, controversial because you have to keep in mind Android had just launched in late 2008. So, you know, the idea of affordable smartphone really wasn't uh, in the market yet. But what I didn't expect was for Nokia to really not know what to do with my findings. Uh, apparently, they said my sample size of 100 was very weak and incomparable to their sample size of millions and millions of data points which they said didn't show any evidence of my insights. And I said, of course it doesn't show evidence because you didn't know that you're supposed to be gathering for this data. This is emotional stuff that hasn't showed up yet in, your, in the measures that you're looking for. But they didn't do anything. So they plugged ahead with their business strategy based off of their quant data and they just kind of left my stuff at the side. Um, well, we all know what happened to Nokia. It's uh, not hard to guess which line represents them. They were so close to the cliff that they couldn't see it coming. And here's the thing, it wasn't because they didn't have enough data. 
You know, they actually had tons of quant data. It's just that they didn't know how to handle data that wasn't easily measurable and didn't show up in existing reports. What could have been their competitive advantage ended up a key contributor to their eventual downfall. Now, it's not just Nokia who privileges quant, you know, measurable statistical data over qualitative ethnographic methods. You know, many companies and organizations now proclaim that they practice data-driven decision-making. But this doesn't always work. You know, making decisions with data in the absence of a clear purpose is actually very dangerous. I, you know, since I spend so much time in China, I see it's happening a lot now with Western companies who want to enter into the Chinese market and capture, a, you know, a big part of it. But they often fail to, you know, deal with the, know how to deal with the complexity of a non-Western market. So since my time at Nokia, I've been obsessing over this one question, which is how and why do quantitative data become, become more valued than qualitative data in organizations? So when I started digging around, I kind of landed in 8th century Greece. Uh, in ancient Greece for over 12 centuries, consulting oracles, a person who could predict the future, was a part of everyday Hellenistic life. You know, people poor and wealthy, slaves and free, they went to oracles asking them very important life questions like, should I get married? Should I go on this voyage? Should we, you know, go into this territory? You know, will, will I come back alive? And the most famous and powerful oracle of all was the Pythia, the goddess of the Oracle of Delphi at the Temple of Apollo, and Apollo being the god of prophecy. Now, the interesting thing is that recent research from geologists and other experts has revealed that when giving prophecies, the Pythia was inhaling enormous amounts of ethylene gas. It actually just so happens that the Temple of Apollo was built over two massive earthquake faults, which created these fissures that allowed for the release of petrochemical chemical fumes from the earth. So this is a bird's eye view of the Temple of Apollo on your left, and the two red lines mark the two earthquake faults, the Delphi Fault and the Kerna Fault. So essentially, when the Pythia was going into prediction mode, she was tripping out. And the Pythia then passed down these oracular predictions derived from you know, the hallucinations of the gas to priests who then interpreted her chemically induced babble as official words for kings and dignitaries and philosophers. So it's pretty crazy that for several centuries this was how small and big decisions were made. But there was a methodology to this entire process. It wasn't just a Pythia, you know. She was actually surrounded, as you can see, by all these priests who then would ask the solicitor, you know, what's the context of your question? And this helped them, you know, present then the Pythia's predictions in a relevant context. Now, the process was actually very tedious because the Pythia's words were often undecipherable because she was high. So oftentimes, people had to wait days before a prediction was made. But this was their form of research. Now, reliance on prophecy is not just a Grecian phenomenon. You know, from the oracle bones of ancient China to the Mayan calendars, people have used various ways to answer the big question of what happens next. You know, so why has humanity been so determined to answer this very timeless and difficult question? Because the future is scary. You know, making a decision without any assurances of the outcome can be absolutely frightening. And this is just as true today as it was for the ancient Greeks. You know, all of us in this room go to bed at night thinking, you know, what's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen in life? What's going to happen to my family, my kids? You know, what's going to happen to my career? What do I write online? You know, blah, blah, blah. It's just that while today we might dismiss the predictions of someone tripping out on fumes being released from cracks in the earth as crazy, but we still believe that prophecy is possible. We still have the question of what comes next, and the oracle of Delphi is still here. You know, you may think that's crazy, you know, how dare I compare the way we answer what comes next to how the Greeks answered it. We're so much more advanced, and you're right, you know, uh, we do use different ways to answer this question. Our modern capability to predict the future relies on the epistemological and te technical breakthroughs from the scientific revolution that created the scientific method, a rationalistic set of approaches to investigate the world. And one of the most fascinating notions to emerge out of the scientific method is the idea that processes of investigation have to be based on empirical and measurable evidence. Now, measurability was actually very important because it allowed other scientists to iterate upon other scientists' work. 
And at the time, the idea that the world could be operationalized into a set of precise quantitative measurements, the light, the stars, you know, that the body could be mediated as a set of numbers was a very new and powerful idea. I mean, we're talking about a time uh, when things were done on gut and memory and intuition. You know, people were drinking mercury to live longer and to cure sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, doctors at the time thought women, you know, women's uteruses were actually wandering, you know, wombs that could go anywhere in their body. And the treatment for this was early marriage and having lots of kids. So it kind of makes sense that back then that the pendulum swung the other way to pure measurement. But when you look at the history of how measurement was created, it wasn't necessarily so clear cut because it wasn't just based on truth. It was based on the politics of the time. So my search to understand how quant became like the de facto, you know, data star led me to the age of measurement in, in 19th century Europe. This was a time when a series of discoveries from non-Euclidean geometry to the Doppler effect made new forms of measurement possible. And the person who best embodies the ethos of this age of measurement is this guy here, Irish-born mathematical uh, and English engineer William Thomson, first Baron Kelvin. And in 1883, he made a statement that essentially said that if you can't measure something, then it doesn't even qualify as knowledge. And this is the exact quote. Now this notion is commonly referred to as the curse of Kelvin because when scientists you know, heard this, they pretty much felt like they were screwed because discovering something wasn't simply enough. Now they not only had to discover something, but they had to measure it. And when I finally like, came upon this part of history, I was just like, oh my God, this is, this is the answer I've been searching for for my question. This is where it all began. This one guy here is like the measurement dictator. And now he's the one who created this curse that's being imposed on the rest of the world. So scientists at the time really did feel like they were cursed because then they were like, you know, scurrying to answer this message of like, how do we measure, you know, the quantity of a message being sent through a telegraph, the speed of a motor, you know, the length of a telephone call. But just as scientists had to measure the things that made electricity possible, they also had to measure electricity itself. Now at that time, scientists could demonstrate electricity, but they hadn't yet figured out how to, you know, harness it for commercial use because they didn't know how to measure it. So with this curse of Kelvin hanging over, you know, scientists' head, they started developing all kinds of electric, you know, measuring devices. And the reason why there were just like so many of these devices, as you can see, is partially because this is also new, but partially because no one could agree for decades how to measure electricity. You know, these fights about, you know, standards ripped apart friendships and, and played on nationalism. You know, is Nicholas Tesla's alternating current or Thomas Edison's direct current better? You know, do we measure resistance with the British Ohm unit or Germany's Siemens unit? And by the way, the British um, Ohm unit won, but the Ohm was named after a German physicist. So do we measure the weight of electricity of the light coming or the light coming out of the bulbs? These were the questions that they were asking back then. This one thing that just seems so standard that we all rely on, this known known, was very unknown and mysterious. The debates about electricity were just as heated as open or closed source, web browser or apps or native apps, you know, single purchase or subscription software, Mac or PC, Android or Apple, HTML5 or Flash. Measurement was not always absolute and it was not a given. It had to be worked out over time. You know, these late 19th and 20th century debates reflect a period in Western history where science challenges religion as authoritative source to answer the age-old question, what comes next? So chanting priestesses were out and scientists were in. And as long as scientists fulfilled Kelvin's, you know, measurement decree, they had the power to produce knowledge and to tell us what comes next. And this is the beginning of the error in conflating measurement with knowledge. The contemporary myth, contemporary myth that we are living in, where measurement is absolute and where measurement is truth, has become just as unquestioned and sacred in modern times as the oracles were in ancient Greece. It's just that now our myths look different and our methods for answering them have changed. Our new mythology is called big data. And in this narrative, prediction has replaced prophecy, numbers have replaced fumes, and measurement has replaced oracles. 
And I and many others actually don't think our society is necessarily any better off with all this big data. For all the innovations we've made in health, you know, gender equality and governance, we have economic equality, systematic atrocities, and massively displaced populations at a scale and speed never before seen in history. But yet, we continue to tell ourselves more big data will make us better. And the big twist in our current myth is that this idea isn't just being reinforced by individual scientists like during the scientific revolution, but also organizations cutting across all sectors, you know, from activists to businesses and government. So in my exploration to understand just, you know, how this happened, I'm going to jump from electricity in the 19th century to the 20th century to look at the coalescence of three forces that led to the current narrative of big data, which are the incipients of the information revolution, the rise of popular mass culture, and the founding of management science. Now, the first force, the information revolution, started in 1949 when Claude Shannon, a scientist at AT&T Bell Labs, invented the bit, a unit of information that lived in the form of a binary signal of one or zero, which is just really a constrained form of electricity. Now, at the time, the notion that information was measurable and storable in digital form on transistors was groundbreaking because up until then measuring instruments were all analog you know morse code was stored on paper photos on plastic film music on records electricity was measured through a moving coil meter temperature through a mercury barometer and time through a dial so with this all of with with all this you know with bits now all of these things could be rendered in the digital form of ones and zeros so the bit is the fundamental building block for everything that computing and big data is built on so it's probably of no coincidence that in 1951, the world's first commercially available general purpose electronic computer, the Fronty Mark I, came from one of the largest electricity companies in the UK, Fronty Limited, which made electricity meters in the late 19th century. This is their meter and then this is their computer. So we can think of computers as direct descendants of electricity. But the birth of the bit marked the beginning, the birth of the bit marked the beginning of the information revolution because it was a technological innovation that made computers like the Fronty One Mark I possible. But it also created a new language for describing the digital world for things like speed, storage, and most importantly, predictability. And fascinatingly, this new language for computers as predictability machines you know, came way before the invention of any personal computer. It showed up in the form of mass culture, the second force that shapes our current narrative of big data. You know, in the 1950s, computers took up an entire room and weighed around 7,300, you know, kilograms, which is 16,000 pounds, and only a few organizations in the world could afford them. But the greater public knew about these computers even though no individual could own them because broadcast television played a pivotal role in introducing the computer as a prediction and measurement device. So starting in the late 1950s, UNIVAC aired commercials on national broadcast television in the U.S. to educate the public about its weather prediction abilities. The hero of our story tonight is the giant electronic brain developed by Remington Rand, UNIVAC. Now, recent experiments show that future use of UNIVAC may give us faster and more accurate weather predictions than were ever possible before. And then, a few months later, the UNIVAC computer had a starring role in a Bugs Bunny cartoon episode. And in this clip, Wile E. Coyote builds a UNIVAC electronic brain to come up with an answer on how to best capture his nemesis, Bugs Bunny. Hmm, now, uh, let's see. Hmm. Rabbit. Hmm. Uh, hole. Yes. Uh, combination lock. Yes. And then a few years later, in the Superman comic, a scientist presents Lois Lane with the perfect husband chosen by her matchmaker, the Univac. 
And then a similar theme also appeared, you know, about 30 years later in a whole in their country in China through a popular comic book and radio program called Black Cat Detective. So clearly this was a global thing, you know. In this story, the black cat used a supercomputer to predict which bird stole nails from a warehouse, and the computer was able to help Black Cat narrow it down to three birds. So clearly this is not just, you know, a U.S. Western thing. This ended up around, you know, other places around the world. And I'd love to find out if something similar appeared in Germany or other other parts, other countries, so please let me know if you, you know, find any other examples. So back then, using a computer to capture a bunny or bird may seem, you know, may have seemed totally far-fetched, but when we look at, you know, sci-fi, mainstream films, anime, manga, we actually start seeing the trope of the computer as a prediction machine over and over again. And outside of popular culture, the third force to shape big data started to develop inside businesses, the founding of management science. You know, during World War II, scientists called operational researchers, they used new techniques to operate the British Army's supply chain of military stuff like, you know, food and tanks and fuel. So these military scientists, you know, used this algorithm developed by George Danzig called linear programming to calculate multiple decision paths, such as the most optimal and least risky outcome for any given war situation, or how to, you know, decrease expenditure losses during a battle, right? And when the war ended, the scientists realized that they could actually repurpose this algorithm for civilian settings in organizations that needed to calculate and predict business-related decisions, such as logistics, shipping, and infrastructure. Now, this application of wartime operational analysis to organizational analysis created the field of management science as we know of today. Now, this you know, may not sound radically new to us, uh, but back then, to manage an organization through numbers was very innovative at the time. It completely changed everything. And if we take a look at modern management sciences, you know, science tools such as Six Sigma, total quality management, capability maturity model integration, we can actually see all the roots of these programs going back to World War II operations. Because the fundamental core in all of these frameworks is that whether for war or civilian settings, is that management is about measurement, modeling, and prediction. Now these three driving forces, the information revolution, popular mass culture, and the founding of management sciences form the foundation of big data's modern narrative as a tool of predictability and measurement. And they're all heralded by, you know, Lord Kelvin from the 1800s. And the after effects of Kelvin's measurement curse are humongous because 132 years later, we can see a sudden curve in measurability. You know, we went from not knowing how to measure basic things such as, you know, heartbeat or electricity to knowing how to measure complex things like organizations and information. So now we're at this point uh, where all this rich history of measurement, of science, you know, popular science, and military technology are finally coming to a place of organizational relevance. And what is officially known to us as the era of big data, which is an era characterized by the idea that more information leads to more knowledge. Now, Using big data has become so appealing that some organizations have started to rely primarily on quantitative data. You know, I see organizations shifting funding from qual to quant all the time. And when I ask the organizations, why do you do this? They tell me that numbers are less biased and more accurate than stories. And they tell me that data from a large sample size is much more reliable than a small sample. This is terribly, terribly wrong. To have impact, numbers need stories and vice versa. When people over-rely on numbers, they actually aren't taking the full advantage of big data. You know, even scientists need stories. Primatologist, you know, Franz de Waal argues that a sense of fairness, the groundwork for morality, can be seen in our ancestors, monkeys. And his argument comes from very rigorous scientific work. And he says that he shows these graphs to, you know, scientists all the time. And you can see the number of copulation sessions, you know, occurrence of swollen genitals, and food transfers related to sex, and how many times male bonobos exchange sex for food from females. So, you know, and all of this data is captured in form of what looks like some regression analysis. But he says that scientists don't really understand what these graphs about morality mean until they see this video. Watch what happens to this monkey here 
on the left when he, you know, he or she gets a grape as a reward instead of a cucumber. And yeah, grapes in monkey world are equivalent to crack. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. She tests a rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. So DeWall says that his use of stories is just as important in his, as his use of you know, quantitative data. And he explains that his fellow primatologists, when he shows them you know, the graphs, they can see the patterns, but seeing the video allows them to feel and experience the texture of data in a way that just isn't possible through graphs that prove statistical significance. Now this story of DeWall and the monkeys shows that if you don't experience something directly, you may not discover the deep meaning of the phenomenon. Because representation of a thing is not the same thing as experiencing a thing. Now this idea of direct experience is what I call thick data. Data produced through qualitative ethnographic research methods that uncover emotions, stories, and meanings. It's all that sticky stuff that's difficult to quantify, and it comes to us in the form of a small sample size, and in return we get an incredible depth of meanings and stories. Thick data is the opposite of big data, which requires a humongous sample size to uncover patterns at large scale. But here's the thing, the processes of analyzing, you know, even producing big data to make it uh, what it is, which involves normalizing, standardizing, defining, and clustering, it flattens it, it strips it of, it co of context, meaning, and stories. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with this as it actually enables us to see patterns at scale, but the, this loss of context comes to us at a cost. And that is why to form a more complete picture, the use of big data must be coupled with thick data because they each produce different types of insights at varying scales and depths. Both qual and quant come with its own deficiencies and opportunities that can be better addressed when integrated together. The sum is greater than the parts. So what does this integration look like? You know, I want to just I'll tell you a quick story where for Alibaba, a digital commerce site based in China, that IPO'd at 22 billion euros, which is the highest IPO ever in history, they built a big data platform for vendors. But the secret to this platform, which is called Observatory, is that it only works if the vendors know how to use it with thick data. So when I was at their offices in Hangzhou a few weeks ago, they explained you know, several examples, and one of them involved birds and nests. You know, in China, people eat bird nests for health reasons. And an edible, the edible bird nest market is around 4.5 billion euros. And the average price of one nest is around 2,200 euros, and it can go as high for, you know, very high quality nests for 4,500 euros. Now, I know it may sound odd to eat bird nests, but so is eating caviar, which is the baby eggs of fish. So the traditional stereotype of a bird nest consumer are wealthy, vain housewives with children who sit at home and they eat this bird nest to make their skin, you know, more, more firm and more supple. But Alibaba's observatory surfaced data points that revealed that bird nest consumers weren't buying diapers or any children's products, so they probably were not housewives with children. So then the vendor, you know, they told their vendor this, and the vendor started to ask their consumers, well, why are you buying these bird nests? And that's how they found out that their consumers were actually pregnant women who wanted to temporarily boost their health during pregnancy. So the vendor then worked with a marketing agency to create a new campaign called which means one person eats, two people become healthy. This new ad targeting pregnant women achieved a click-through rate of 61% and a 46% ROI. Now, the vendor's success comes from the integration of quant data points with further thick data research. Now, another illustration of the importance of marrying big data and thick data can be seen in the work of defending human rights. 
Nathaniel Raymond is a human rights investigator at the Signal Program at Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. His job and his team's job is to investigate war crimes around the world. And oftentimes, the places Nathaniel and his team works are just way too dangerous for them to go in person. So they created an entirely new approach to data analysis that uses satellite imagery to remotely assess areas of conflict from their program's office in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Now, this presents new data complications and new data opportunities. Uh, during the summer of 2011, Nathaniel received reports of mass graves you know, filled with Nuba people created by the Sudanese armed forces in the city of Kadugli. Now, Kadugli is a city that Nathaniel couldn't travel to, but a satellite could. So Nathaniel's team used satellite imagery of Kadugli taken over the course of the summer to assess what was going on here. So you can see that this is a time lapse. And this allowed them to see what appear to be images consistent with body bags near disturbed earth. But Nathaniel and his team knew that digital data wasn't enough to make a rather serious claim they had to find a new way to verify the information collected from satellites with a human source on the ground. Essentially, they needed thick data, non-digitally derived data. So Nathaniel found a contact, one of the very few people left in Kadugli, and he asked that person to physically walk to the site of the suspected mass grave. And as the individual arrived on the site, Nathaniel's team asked a sat, you know, asked, tasked a satellite to the location. The individual then gave an account of what they were seeing and measured the exact distance of the suspected grave to a nearby radio tower. Everything measured up. Nathaniel's team had their corroboration. And only then was he and his team comfortable with making the assessment that these were indeed mass graves. In the process of doing this, they actually had developed a whole entirely new type of methodology for remote sensing that combined satellite imagery with information collected remotely from sources on the ground. This is their inner version of integrating big and thick data. Now, I asked Nathaniel, you know, why was it so important to have this additional data stream from a human being located in Kadugli, considering how dangerous it was? And he explained that the presence of data is not the president's presence of proof or evidence. You know, satellite imagery is simply reflections of light from Earth that then produces imagery that is consistent with the heuristics of an object. They are not the actual thing itself. He says that without multiple streams of evidence outside of satellite imagery, he could have mistaken a bunch of holes for mass graves. Now, Nathaniel says that in his line of work, there is a problem with people over-extrapolating digital data because they think it's more corroborative, corroborative because it's captured by a computer. Now, the problem of privileging digital data over other forms of less quantifiable data, it isn't just isolated to the field of human rights. It's also pervasive in academia, you know, businesses and organizations of all sizes. The menu is not the meal. The map is not the land. The data is not the thing. As we acquire, store, and process more of our information digitally, we need to ensure that we have data streams that allow us to corroborate hunches and signals from dig digital data with experiences on the ground. We live in a time where we're still enamored by things that look like new technology. We have to make sure that we don't mistake novelty for revolution. You know, social change will not come in the form of a service. The magic isn't about, you know, one type of data being the most innovative, because then we would be self-inflicting data fascism on ourselves. The magic is really in seeing how all the parts fit together, for it really depends on how you slice the data and from what perspective you look at it, and if you're able to combine both, then the value of both methodologies come out, if you know what questions to ask. In the era of big data, we need a new way to think about information. We need a new kind of socio-data science, one that unifies qual and quant. 
So this to me is an important problem to be solved by nonprofits, global corporations, government startups, activist groups, pretty much anyone trying to figure out how to gain significant insights into the behavior of citizens, customers, and users to, to create systems that allow us to live more balanced lives. Whether it's to send on the streets of Istanbul or Baltimore or decrease sales of a product or declining you know, audience viewership, these are all examples of people giving feedback in ways that the system can't neatly capture you know, into some predefined box or variables or surveys or index measures. And this is why the creation of any technological system, platform, or app must involve storytellers to surface narratives, gaps, and meaning. Now, modern storytellers come in various forms. You know, they could be ethnographers, artists, journalists, community organizers, social media managers, local guides, photographers, designers, product managers. It pretty much really could be anyone who draws on empathy as their interface with data points. Because empathy is what drives us to make art, to make sense of our society and ourselves, to settle differences or to help strangers. Empathy is one road to asking why and to what end. In a world where, where we're talking about the increasing automation and tracking of practically everything, some of which happens by choice and some not, asking ourselves, how can I preserve the human element in everything I do? How do we build empathetic and impactful systems? It could actually be one of the most consistently revolutionary acts that all of us can do in a time of liquid modernity. And in the process of doing that, we can lift the curse of Kelvin. So thank you so much for listening.